Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. I would like to discuss with you the methods of securing final impressions for complete dentures. As you know, there are many, many methods for securing impressions. Today I would like to review with you a common method, a practical method, and a method that we use here at the university. The three types of impressions that are commonly taken are usually categorized as follows. The functional impression is an impression taken with the tissues under tension. Two examples of this might be the use of a functional wax for securing the complete denture impression. And a second example might be the use of a tissue conditioner for securing the final denture impression. The most common type of impression would be the semi-functional impression. In this method, the tissues are recorded with some areas placed under tension while other areas are at normal rest. The third type of impression is an impression taken with the tissues at rest. Most people that advocate this type of an impression believe that the tissues are under no tension whatsoever. An example of this type would be the mucostatic impression. Over the years, many methods and many technologies have been involved in developing the methods we're using today. In 1969, Dr. Franks reported in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry the results of a very interesting experiment to study the factors and the pressures involved when complete denture impressions are taken. In the following uh, graph, you will see the results of his study. First of all, he studied the different types of materials used for complete denture impressions. He found that the alginate impression, when mixed to a regular consistency, created the most pressure. Next was rubber base, and he used light body rubber. He found when the alginate was mixed to a thin consistency, less pressures were developed, and that the least pressures were developed when zinc oxide eugenol was used. It might be interesting to note that the pressures involved were of a fairly low nature of two to four pounds per square inch. Dr. Franks went on to modify a custom acrylic impression tray in two ways to see if this would have any effect upon the final pressures developed in, a, in an impression. To begin with, he placed a number of holes in the impression tray, and he found that these holes would reduce the pressures developed inside of the impression considerably. He also modified his tray by placing a spacer between the acrylic tray and the study model. This also reduced the pressures considerably. When both the holes and the relief space were used together, the pressures involved in the final impression were reduced considerably, as you can see before you. Now I would like to go to the chair and start the sequence of obtaining impressions for a complete denture patient. To begin with, we will take an alginate preliminary impression. We'll select a stock metal tray and extend the borders of that tray with wax to correct for any under extensions. When we have obtained a good impression, we'll pour the model and proceed to make a final impression tray. This afternoon, we're fortunate to have Mr. Louis Sellers, who's going to be our demonstration patient. This to begin with, we'll take Mr. Sellers' dentures out. 
and will begin the sequence of taking a preliminary impression. I have already secured a McGowan tray, which is a tray you're probably familiar with, and I'm going to add some red utility wax in certain areas to extend this tray. We'd like to secure the most accurate preliminary impression that we can in order that we might secure an accurate preliminary cast. Normally with these trays, I like to extend around the tuberosity region and the hamular notch and in the labial part of the tray. I was able to try this tray in uh, prior to being on camera to save us a little time. When you have your wax extension added, you can then try this in the patient's mouth. Okay. When you're satisfied that it's properly extended, then you can go ahead and take your preliminary impression, which we will do here. We will be using an alginate impression material, a gel trait, which you're familiar with, in here at school, we used it in a pre we use it in a prepackaged form. I'm sure you're all familiar with this technique, but we'll go through it anyway. <laughs> After I place the preliminary impression material in, Mr. Seller's mouth will fade out for a moment after we get this in and back in the material set. Make sure you thoroughly mix the material and take plenty of time to mix it to a nice creamy consistency. Most of you will have your dental assistants doing this in your office. and we'll proceed to load the impression tray. I like to pull the material over the flanges and then we'll proceed to go to the patient's mouth. Make certain that you pull the lip down over the flange of the impression tray. Okay, we'll fade out here for a moment and come back after the material has set. Okay, we'll check it this time to see if the material is set, which it has, and we'll remove it from the mouth. At this time, I'd like to show you the areas that we are most critical about in analyzing our preliminary impression. First of all, the hamular notch should show up very definitely in the preliminary impression. And the posterior should be well delineated. The flanges should be of a proper length and never under it if possible. And the free areas should be defined. Also, there are no irregularities or gross irregularities with impression. Now I'd like to go on and we'll see a low preliminary impression. I've selected a uh, stock tray prior to starting our filming today and I'd like to add the utility wax in the areas that are most commonly modified, namely the lateral throat form and then the labial area and sometimes over the retromolar pad. This is a simple thing to do and many times 
It means the difference between success or failure in taking a preliminary impression. When you're taking these impressions, accuracy is speed, and it's foolish to accept a preliminary impression that is less than adequate. Taking a final impression is really taking a corrective wash. And if you have a crude impression tray, you are really only taking another preliminary impression. I checked this tray, tray previously, and it is adequate in the labial region. I'll proceed to take an alginate impression of the lower jaw. This is also a step that could be accomplished by your dental assistant. The mixing of the material and loading the tray. This is a very simple procedure, but many times it is oversimplified by the dentists and really good preliminary impressions are not always obtained and utilized. We'll mix the material vigorously and place it in our stock tray. Many of you may like to run this under running water or flow a little water over this just prior to taking the impression, but it is not convenient in front of the camera to do this. When I place it in the mouth, we will fade out for just a moment while the material is setting. Be careful to place your tray accurately before seating it to place. We'll check to see if this material is set now, which it has. And we'll carefully remove this impression from Mr. Seller's mouth. This one looks adequate, and I'd like to go over a few of the areas with you that we should be highly critical of. If we can get a close-up of this impression, this is an excellent view of the retromylohyoid fossa. If this area is picked up on the preliminary impression accurately, it's much easier to secure the final impression. Also, you'll notice that we have completely covered the retromolar pad. And on the other side, we have an identical situation. There are a few small voids which can be blocked out in wax on the cast. All other areas within the impression are adequate. And if anything, they're a little overextended. You can tolerate overextension on this preliminary impression and then analyze your preliminary cast or your study cast to decide where the borders of your final impression tray are going to be. As you can see, we're a little overextended beyond the external oblique line. In our next sequence, we will be going to the laboratory and I will have poured up our preliminary models, or preliminary casts, and I will proceed to construct the final impression trays for our following impressions. In the intermittent time interval, I have poured up the preliminary model, or the preliminary cast, and I have them before you. With these, I will proceed to create or to make the final impression tray. Before we do this, I'd like to go through the sequence of events which we will follow. We will start by drawing the outline of the final impression tray on the cast. Then a wax spacer will be placed with 28 gauge green wax. Then we will mix a cold cure acrylic and adapt this to our 
preliminary cast. And then we will retrieve the tray with the wax spacer and trim. Following this, we will go back to the mouth and border mold the final impression trays where we desire to do so. Following this, we will, we will remove the wax spacer and place small holes throughout the impression tray. This time we'll go back to our model and for sake of time today with the television I'd like to use only the maxillary cast to make our impression tray on. The procedure is identical with the lower impression tray. So to begin with I'd like to outline on our cast the area that we will be covering with our final impression tray. And this is the first step in constructing the tray. If you can find the fovea palatini in the preliminary impression, you can pencil just beyond that area over your hamular notches. into the buccal vestibule, the buccal frenum, the labial flange, the labial vestibule, the labial frenum, and the same on the other side. For those of you who have made a number of dentures by this time, it's fairly easy to follow the anatomy of your cast, even if it is a little bit overextended. I'd also like to do this on the lower at this time, even though we're not going to be making a tray on this model. You can see here in this close-up that in the external oblique area, the uh, external oblique line area, we are overextended, and we can pencil on our cast the most likely area for the flange of the denture or the flange of the impression tray and this can be modified at a later time when we go to the mouth with compound. But again, we outline the entire periphery of our final impression tray, particularly in the lateral throat area, otherwise known as the retromylohyoid space, floor of the mouth, in this manner. This will guide us in placing the wax spacer on the cast. Now Dr. Franks in his article used a base plate wax for the spacer. In this sequence I'm going to use 28 green, gauge green wax because a number of us have found that the green wax is a much better spacer and is a more practical spacer. So at this time we'll go back to our maxillary cast and proceed to adapt the wax spacer. Of course the 28 gauge wax is supplied in sheets. I won't have to heat this much at all because being in front of the lights of the television camera it is a little bit soft at this time. This can be adapted usually one half of the model at one time and finger pressure can be used to initiate this adaptation. The lines that we drew on the cast show through this wax very nicely and it is possible to trim back to that line with our number seven wax spatula. Also, a piece of moist cotton is advantageous in adapting this. I have previously lubricated the model with a, an acrylic separator and this facilitates the removal of the wax spacer with the final impression tray. Now we'll trim back to that line and proceed to do the other side. We are going to try to, re to retrieve the uh, spacer with the final impression tray after it is formed. Now we're 
Use another piece of wax. The wax or the acrylic separator actually makes it a little more difficult to adapt the wax, but it's necessary when you are trying to retrieve the wax with the impression tray. After you've done this a few times, it goes very, very quickly. And you again follow the line you've drawn on your cast and remove the wax, the excess wax. Now at this time, we're almost ready to start mixing the cold cure acrylic, which we will be making our tray out of. nice part about using the wax spacer, you can readapt it, you can add wax where necessary, and you can shorten it where necessary. Again, going back to the line that you previously drew on your cast. Now at this time, I'd like to show you the material we will be using for our final tray. It's a material called Kerr Forma Tray. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Any number of cold cure tray materials are adequate for this procedure. This is a convenient material because it is prepackaged and I'll mix this. I'll mix it up and then I can do my final adaptation of the uh, wax while we're waiting for the acrylic to polymerize. The monomer for this acrylic comes in a flexible tube and it comes in a convenient mixing container as I mentioned. I like to use a popsicle stick for mixing this material because it's very difficult to remove from a blade. When we mix this thoroughly I can go back to our model for a moment, to our cast and do any refinements I would like. such as flowing this wax together while we're waiting for the acrylic to polymerize. You can also flame this material, trying to create an even thickness, a block out throughout. Now we will also take a rolling uh, pad. This is a very convenient method for rolling out the acrylic material and we'll use this to create a flat, thin bulk of material before we apply it to our wax spacer. Once the acrylic has begun to polymerize, I like to wet my hand and gather the material together. About the time that it no longer will stick to your hands would be an excellent time to begin rolling it out on the mixing pad. I'll roll it into a ball. It's actually a lot of fun to do this. You have to move fairly quickly with this because if you wait a little bit too long you don't have the time that you really need to adapt it to the model. Once this has begun to polymerize to the point where it will hold together, you can remove this from the board and immediately lay it over your model and begin to adapt, to adapt it with finger pressure. If you do this quickly, you'll be able to go back with a sharp instrument or a number seven spatula and trim most of the excess, which saves you quite a bit of time when you go to trim the final impression tray. I like to use a red-handled knife, but uh, any number of uh, 
sharp instruments could be used, such as a sharp number seven. The material is still soft enough that I can trim away the excess and still readapt the material. As you're trimming it, it tends to distort, and you have plenty of time to go back and readapt this. It might be noted that we keep the wax spacer just short of the area that we penciled on the cast so that when we go to the mouth to border mold our impression tray that it will be supported by the acrylic on the extension of the flange. This is the method we use to construct this tray. Now in a few minutes this would be adequately prelim polymerized, but to facilitate matters I have already made the final impression trays on this model and retrieved them for you and I'd like to show them to you at this time. You can see, if we can get in a little bit closer here, that the wax spacer was retrieved at the same time, the acrylic tray was removed from the model on both the upper and lower impression. I would like to show you just on the upper at this time that this tray really should look like a denture without teeth on it if you've constructed it adequately. The more accurate your final impression tray is, the easier it is to secure an accurate final impression. You can also see the spacer on the lower tray. Now at this time, we will go back to the clinical situation and in the areas of exposed acrylic on the periphery of this tray, we will add compound to border mold our final impression tray. At this time, we are going to go around the periphery of these trays with compound when you have an accurate preliminary impression tray, it makes border molding a much simpler procedure. I have here before you the water bath, which is at about 135 degrees Fahrenheit, and we do not have a gas flame here at this unit, so I'm going to use a Hanot torch for my source of heat. Uh, this is a little more difficult to use. I'll only start border molding part of this maxillary tray and then after we get a little ways along we'll stop and during the interim period I'll complete the border molding in order that we don't use a great deal of time on the camera. We'll heat the uh, compound stick in the flame and begin to adapt this material to the periphery of the tray And then before going to the mouth, we always temper the material in our water bath. And then continue with our border molding procedure, manipulating the lips, border molding the entire periphery of the denture. I'll add one more section before we go off camera. Again, if the impression tray is an accurate one, this procedure goes very quickly. If it is a bulky, inaccurate tray, this can be an exercise in futility. You can grab the cheek and tug on the freedom areas which will usually show up in the border molding as you can see here. Maybe we can pan down on this for just a moment and see that the yeah you can see now that the compound is added to accurately re register the periphery of the denture now at this time we will proceed to border mold the rest of these trays and we will do that off camera. Okay. 
We have uh, just completed the border molding procedure and uh, I'd like you to see it this time. It didn't take very long to do this because our trays were accurate in most areas. In our next sequence, we'll be going back to the laboratory and removing the wax spacer, placing a wax occlusal rim on the lower tray and placing a number of relief holes in order to decrease the compression or the pressures within the final impression. We're back to the laboratory now and I'd like to show you the sequence in the final preparation of the impression trays in for the mouth. I have already removed the wax spacer from the mandibular impression tray and you can see it is still present in the maxillary tray. I'm going to run through the following procedure only in the mandibular tray and the same procedure is done in the maxillary tray. Now at this time I'm going to adapt a wax occlusal rim to the mandibular tray. This is not added to the maxillary tray and we do this only to give the tongue support and bring it into a normal tongue position while we take our final impression. Again, we would be using a different source for our heat and it takes a little bit longer to use the alcohol torch for this. But we place simply a small occlusal rim on the mandibular tray to give the tongue support. Just following this, we'll place our holes to allow the impression material to exude from the impression. Many times uh, you can use a little bit of sticky wax prior to the adaptation of your occlusal rim to hold, to help hold the rim in place, although I like to sear the material to the tray which we'll do in the following. Seal the rim in place. And I'll proceed. I'm not going to finish this at this time, but I will place a few holes so you can see the manner in which we do this. This is a number six round burr a carbide and I'll use it to place a few holes in our tray. I don't think you can place too many holes although I usually space these out at about a half an inch. You can also use a smaller burr if you like. I think you can see that I've placed these around the periphery, have very important areas in the lateral throat form. I'll place a couple here. I think you can see them now. And we'll proceed to go around these trays in the following manner. On the maxillary tray, I also will place probably five holes in the palate and also a number of holes around the periphery of the final impression tray. I'm going to complete these steps prior to going back to our patient and uh, we'll see you at the chair. We're now approaching the final sequence and obtaining the final impression for the complete dentures. I'd like to list the final objectives before us. Uh, we will select the proper impression material Sometimes this is a matter of choice for the individual clinician. We'll simply mix this material and place in our tray, which has been accurately trimmed. We'll seat the impression in the mouth. And when we retrieve both the maxillary and the mandibular impressions, we'll proceed to place the posterior palatal seal on our maxillary denture. At this time, I've selected the light-bodied permalastic for the final impression material for the mandibular denture which I'm going to take the, make the impression of first. 
I'm sure you're all familiar with this material. It really is an enjoyable procedure to take final impressions when the final impression uh, trays have been accurately constructed. Let me place this out of the way here. And now we'll proceed to mix our material and place it in the tray. During the interim time, I've added permalastic adhesive, which is a mercaptan adhesive, to the mandibular impression tray. And you'll mix this similar to its use for other applications in dentistry, trying to remove all of the bubbles if possible. This is a light bodied material and will flow considerably. However, with an accurate impression tray, we are not depending upon the impression material to extend the peripheries of our impression. This time we'll go to the mouth and ask Mr. Sellers to rest his tongue in a normal position against the wax rim. I think you can see that. And at this time, I'm going to fade out again, and we'll wait for this material to set, and we'll retrieve the impression from Mr. Sellers' mouth. One thing I would like to mention while we're holding this impression in place is that once you have seated the impression, Hold it with minimal pressure. Very enough pressure to keep the impression tray in place because the material will continue to flow. And if it's held under a lot of pressure, or even a little bit of pressure, more than necessary, you'll go right down to the impression tray and give, and you will have distorted tissue. At this time, the material is set, and I'm going to retrieve this from the mouth. This looks pretty good, and I'd like to. Uh, at this time, just point out a couple of areas to you. And you can see the accuracy that's obtained with this method. You get very, very nice impressions, particularly in the retromyle hyoid area, which is adequately registered in the impression material. The retromolar pads, a very acceptable impression. You'll also find that when you've secured a good mandibular impression, you will tend to have an S shape, a very s gentle sloping in an S pattern to the lingual flange of the denture. I think you can see that fairly well. It's very gentle, but it's there. Now we'll proceed uh, to take the maxillary impression. I'm going to move these impression materials, and we're going to switch to a zinc oxide eugenol final impression paste. I would like to mention that in the beginning of this sequence we showed a graph of impression materials and it showed that rubber base was not as accurate as the uh, coal floor, the zinc oxide eugenol materials. However, even Dr. Frank admits that under certain circumstances, he enjoys using this material for mandibular impressions. And many of us at this school will use the light-bodied rubber base with blockout and with holes in our impression tray. Now at this time, I'll proceed to mix this material and place it in the maxillary tray. This material is a little more sticky and uh, See if I can find my little mixer here. And of course, at this uh, time, you've all mixed this material. And in a moment, we'll carry it to our impression tray. You can see that I've added the holes in the maxillary tray, possibly at this distance, it's hard to see. But we'll place the material into the maxillary tray, carefully spreading the material and I also like to bring the material over the flanges of the denture. I generally will 
use a lubricant on the face, which we have not done yet at this in this sequence, so I'm going to be very careful not to get this material on Mr. Seller's face, but when you do this in your offices or at your uh, chair, it's a good idea to place a lubricant on the patient's face. Again, bring the material over the flanges of the denture. I do not like to load the posterior of the tray too heavily so that it will not go down his mouth. We're not using a tremendous bulk of material, and it's really not necessary if you have an accurate tray. Now, once in place, I will gently place the impression tray where it belongs, but I'm holding it with a minimal amount of pressure once it's seated. This is an a uh, corrective wash, and a great deal of pressure is not needed to hold this in place. In fact, at this time, I'm holding this with only enough pressure to maintain the tray on the end of my finger. Now we'll fade out for a few minutes while this material sets, and we'll retrieve the final maxillary impression. And we'll test to see if this material is set. We've given it almost eight minutes here. And uh, I'll retrieve it for time. Sometimes they're very difficult to remove. Maybe we can get a close-up of this. This looks like a good impression. Now you can see E, which an accurate final impression can be obtained when a proper tray is used. And it facilitates the entire sequence of taking final impressions and saves a great deal of chair time. Now at this time, you can see fovea in this area. At this time, I'm going to quickly trim the posterior border and if I can get my torch over here I'll place the posterior palatal seal and I'd like you to see that this is an area that's too often overlooked and uh, many times the posterior palatal seal is not placed properly within the denture we'll dry the impression at this time and then we'll place our wax. We're using Kerr Correcta wax here which is a wax that will flow at mouth temperature. And we'll Place this in the proper area within the denture, flowing it to about one millimeter of thickness. The area will vary depending upon the case, but generally we will go around the periphery of the tuberosity, across the hamular notch. When I get done here, I'll show you a close-up of this. And when we completely place the posterior seal wax, we will go to the mouth and let the tissues determine the exact position for the posterior palatal seal. It's more accurate to place these in wax and to try and carve the posterior palatal seal on a cast. However, when this goes to the mouth, you ought to leave it for an adequate length of time to get proper movement of the material and proper registration of those border tissues. For it's this border area, this posterior palatal seal, that helps create retention on the maxillary dent. And when we began today, I mentioned to you that some impressions are semi-functional in nature, and this is why we are deliberately placing these tissues under a little bit of tension. I think you can see very nicely here the position of the postural seal, particularly noting that it goes up 
and around into the coronoid notch area. If you stop right at the hamular notch, many times you'll have a leak in the seal of your impression. And we'll put this in the mouth at this time. Normally, I will put this in the mouth from three to five minutes, and then when we remove it from the mouth, trim it back to the original outline and add or subtract material if you think it is necessary and then go back to the mouth again. I'm not going to leave this in for that length of time at this point, but I will show you the completed impression. Now we have gone through an entire sequence from the preliminary impression to final impressions for obtaining accurate final impressions for complete dentures with a minimum tissue distortment and a minimum, minimum amount of compression of tissues. We have really well followed the concepts outlined by Dr. Frank with a few modifications that are, uh, will expedite your own clinical efforts. I think you'll find if you follow these procedures and carry them out carefully, at the chair, you'll end up with very accurate impressions for your complete dentures. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.